Gracious God, we give thanks to you for this day and the grace given to us today. Thank you for all of the gifts that we enjoy for our church family. I pray you would help us to grow in our understanding and wisdom, even in learning our story, so that we can more faithfully embody it in the present. As your people, your followers, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Today, what I'm hoping to do is kind of get from about the year 400 to 800. All right. So y'all okay with four centuries and 50 minutes or so? <laughs> this, is the best we, this is the best we can do. We're on week four, so we got we to gotta make progress. And I'm sure once we get to the Reformation, we'll, we'll go a little bit slower. Um, so we'll do the best we can. Last week, we got all the way up until the reign of Constantine in the fourth century and uh, talked about the events that led up to, to those moments. And so we were looking at the story of the church going from being a persecuted minority through most of those first 300 years or so to it being tolerated that his persecution ends with Edict of Milan and Constantine's rise to become the Roman emperor. And then it's going to move from being tolerated to the official church or the official religion of the empire during the reign of Theodosius. So these are two of the most important emperors in the history of Christianity because of that transition from persecuted minority to official church. All right, so these are Constantine's dates. You see early 400, early 4th century to Theodosius. And when I say the, it becomes the official church, it's the Nicene version of Christianity. That is Christianity that affirms the Nicene Creed. Remember we talked about the Nicene Creed being the product of two important ecumenical councils. Nicaea in 325, Constantinople in 381, and they give us what we recite today as the Nicene Creed. Over against, do you remember what the uh, sort of um, opposing form of Christianity was called? The, yeah, the Arian heresy. This Arian version that uh, argued that Jesus was less than the Father in some important way. And so the Nicene Creed aff affirms, of course, that Jesus is... God from God, light from light, true God from true God, <laughs> begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father. Remember that whole, that whole thing. So that's established here. There is some problems in between, which we'll talk about in a second. So once you get this as the new reality, I want to talk about sort of well, how does that affect the church? What sort of responses do we have as a result? I mentioned last time that some people see the rise of Constantine as a great good, because it ceases, you know, sort of the, the, the bloody persecution of Christians. The age of the martyrs comes to an end. Others see it as the beginning of corruption in church hierarchies. Because now being a part of the church is a way to be the emperor's friend. You know, to, to be a bishop is a way to uh, grow in glory or power or wealth. And so some people see that as, um, you know... This, this, um, this emergence of Christendom where the church and state are walking hand in hand with each other as a, neg a great negative uh, for the purity or holiness of the church. So as a result, we talked about the monastic response to that, remember? That many people see, well, now the church will be corrupted and compromised, so we're withdrawing from society out into the deserts, and we're going to do the real true thing here. Martyrdom was seen as a kind of, uh, I mean, monasticism was seen as a kind of white martyrdom. You know, where it wouldn't be bloody, but you would still be giving your all, showing your full devotion to Christ by withdrawing from society. And initially, those are isolated folks. We have isolated desert monks. Eventually, they become little communities, which will be the precursors to monastic communities that will emerge later in the 5th century. All right, so there, that's one way to respond to it, right, is withdrawal. You know, if you think church is corrupt, it's in walking with uh, the emperor, we'll go do the pure thing away from the established church. That's one way to do it. Another is that there's a Donatist division within the church. The Donatists were a group of Christians who thought that the church must be pure. And as a result of that, anyone who had uh, capitulated or, you know, um, disowned their faith or Christ during the age of persecution, their baptism was seen as not being valid, like they weren't real Christians. And if you were baptized by a bishop who either surrendered scriptures to the persecuting authorities or who in some other way compromised, then perhaps your baptism is not valid. So they're like pursuing this 
this sort of what you might call a pure church that has no spot or blemish related to the persecution. The response to the Donatist division, you actually, this, this will continue up until the time of St. Augustine. St. Augustine will write against the Donatist. He basically just sees it as it's merciless and uh, lacking in sort of compassion and understanding. He's like, hey, the times were hard, you know, when people were being <laughs> killed for their faith. And people's emotions sometimes get the best of them, you know, or their fears get the best of them. So people sometimes denied or renounced their faith or pretended they weren't Christians. And then once the persecution was over, they came back into the church. So the Donatists just aren't wanting to let them back in, you know. Uh, people like Augustine were saying, there is no such thing as a totally pure church. Only God sees who, those who are truly his. But within the church, it might be a mix of people in all sorts of conditions. And he's like, that's the way it should be. That's the way it has to be. You know? He actually argues it can't be any other way since we don't know what's going on in people's hearts. And the persecution failures would just be one instance of weakness but there could be countless others that other people, you know, are experiencing. So, but it's actually a really big problem, an issue for the church. You had Donatist churches and sort of non-Donatist churches. Eventually, the Donatists will sort of fizzle out, you know. They're just um, hardcore on that. Um, there's also the pagan response. We need some WD-40, don't we, Randy? <laughs> on that. Uh, the pagan response, you might imagine if... The Emperor Theodosius is going to say, well, now Christianity will be the official religion of the empire. And the, the religions of old, you know, these countless centuries of um, people honoring Hercules and Zeus and et cetera, et cetera. It's like that's no mas. All right. <laughs> no more for that. You could, people aren't just going to say, OK, all right, OK, great. You know, sign up. Some might for fear now become Christians. You know, they would fear uh, re reprisal from the emperor. But the pagan response is not to take it lightly. They do push back. And after Constantine, there's several emperors between these two. But one of them is this guy named Julian. And in history, he's remembered as Julian the Apostate. Because <laughs> basically, he tries to reverse course with Theodosius and reestablish all the pagan temples and all of the worship offered in those temples to Roman gods. Um, he thinks that the, the problems that the empire are experiencing, like if they ever lose a battle, they blame it on the Christians. They'll say, it's because we abandoned the worship of our former deities and now we're, we're suffering the consequences. So reestablish that. Because remember, religion in antiquity is not about being good. It's about getting the gods on your side, right? And so if, you, if it looks like the gods aren't on your side, you need to do something about that. Yeah. Julian tries... Uh, but after him, Theodosius comes to power and reestablishes Nicene Christianity. Yes? Have there been other religions that ever had the pull that Christianity did that were put down? Or, or was it pretty much everybody just coexisted until? Um, well, since the Romans had this policy of you could add your own little personal religions right. as, long as, you, <laughs> as long as you accepted the Roman pantheon. And even more than the Roman pantheon, by this time, there's the worship of the honoring the emperor as a divine being and Rome itself. Like Rome takes on this uh, godlike character. So you start having temples to Roma, you know, as a deity. So like they're deifying their own empire. So that's sort of a appeal by force, you know, like <laughs> you have to accept these or you face the consequences. Christianity has this more organic pull, right? It's, it's pulling people into it, even though you face bad consequences um, in the face of the empire. Uh, except now, at this point, it's, it's a more peaceful time for Christianity by the time of Theodosius. So becoming Christian might seem politically expedient. Not that that ever happens anymore, you know? Uh, <laughs> or someone might, you know, pretend to be a Christian or just take on Christian because it's politically expedient. I don't know. Um, you can see it's happening back then um, as well. So monastic response, Donatist response, pagan response. And there are other Christians who take what you might call a middle way. By that, I mean they don't think they need to go out into the deserts, withdraw from society. But they're also not going to compromise with the emperor. 
So they're trying to find ways to exist within the society and do their thing faithfully um, as far as they can and try to reform things and hold back injustices and such uh, as much as they can, but by staying plugged in. Does this make sense? So you might think of this as kind of a trying to be faithfully present in society without compromise, but also without withdrawing. And that's always difficult because you're going to be pulled by, uh, you're pulled in different directions. And the temptations for compromise will abound. So these are just some names of some important figures during that time. These are also on the notes page there for you. Athanasius is um, one of the most prominent. He's the great defender of orthodoxy at the Council of Nicaea. It's his arguments against Arianism that end up winning the day so that the, you know, the votes at Nicaea can be virtually unanimous against Arianism and in favor of what becomes Nicene Orthodoxy. All right. um, so Athanasius is a really important figure. Um, you can still read his works today. His most famous is called On the Incarnation. It's a short, accessible book in English. It reads really well and easy. Um, arguing like why did God have to become man in order to save, um, in order to save us? It's fantastic, and, and it shows that it, even at that early stage, you've got some uh, well-developed theology and strong theologians able to make the case. So I still commend recommend that to you. Some others like Ambrose, Jerome, and Augustine. These are all um, third and fourth century figures. All right. Ambrose, let me tell you a little bit about him. He was the Bishop of Milan. He uh, was, had, had this big reputation. A lot of people were drawn to him uh, because he was, he was very smart. He was also skilled in rhetoric and just really genuine hearted. But an example of his uncompromising role, he doesn't withdraw. He's there in Milan, which is a, really an important city during that time. There were times in which the emperor lived in Milan instead of Rome, because Rome got overcrowded at times. And so it's an important city. There's one time where he denies the emperor communion because he thought the, commu the emperor acted unjustly in battle. <laughs> and uh, so he won't... <laughs> this, is, this is a risky move, okay? <laughs> you understand? So the, he, he writes this letter rebuking the emperor, saying you've acted unchristianly, and uh, as a result, you're not allowed to take communion until you repent. What do you think the emperor does? He repents. <laughs> it's like, believe it or not, and like this shocking twist, that, you know, that's the way the story should go, right? That's the way it usually goes in history, right? You stand up to the most powerful figures, they just take you out. In this case, Theodosius does repent, comes and prostrates himself in front of Theodosius, the bishop, to repent and receive communion. So it's kind of a remarkable moment, but it shows this sort of uncompromising spirit by some in the church. Jerome is another interesting figure. He's one of the great scholars of the fourth century, most famous for his translation of the Bible into Latin, which becomes the Latin Vulgate, and it's the Bible used for the next thousand years in the West, in the Western Empire. He actually moves to Bethlehem, gets a little crew of people around him, and they start working on translating uh, the Bible from Hebrew and Greek manuscripts into Latin. And he had access to Hebrew and Greek manuscripts that you know, disappear with history, like we don't have access to anymore. Uh, so the Latin Bible's really important. Jerome was, uh, he, he's commissioned to do so by the Bishop of Rome uh, that we later call the Pope. Uh, so he's working closely with the institutional church to provide this thing for them. Uh, at the time, you had translations of the Bible going in every direction, uh, and you even had earlier Latin versions, but uh, many people kept finding problems with them. And so the church is like, Jerome, give us a good, solid translation to, so we can get rid of these poor ones and just have one established one. Massive influence. I mean, imagine the thing you do is what guides the church for a thousand years. You know, that's pretty big. And then famously, there's Augustine. St. Augustine, it's impossible to overstate his importance and influence for the Western Church. His theological, philosophical ideas about the Trinity, for instance, or about the nature of grace um, shape all Christian thinking thereafter. It's, it's hard to imagine a Christianity without St. Augustine in many ways. And, you know, he's this... We did 
a biography of him in our little church biographies uh, session last summer for any of you who were here. So I don't want to like restate his whole biography, but <laughs> he's a really important figure who grows up uh, Roman. He's a speechwriter. Eventually, he's a speechwriter for the emperor. He's the equivalent of a rhetoric professor all before he becomes a Christian. Um, and when he does become a Christian, it's like all those powers are put towards understanding the faith. He's something of a proto-psychologist, if you've ever read his The Confessions, because the way they analyze human nature, just analyzing the human psyche, uh, is, there's so much insight there that people still find relevant. And I know many theologians and Christian philosophers who say outside the Bible, no other book has impacted their life more than Augustine's Confessions. If you were to pick it up and read it today, it also reads very easily, so it's not hard to access. Uh, and I guarantee you will see yourself in the book. <laughs> and it's like so good at like unearthing that human psyche. You'll be like, I can relate to that. I see myself in those thoughts or in those temptations or in that way of uh, thinking about the world. It's beautiful and powerful. Augustine's also important. He becomes bishop of a community, and he is the bishop when the Western Empire starts to fall. So in 410, you see there's an attack by the Goths, and um, they will sack Rome. Interesting, the Goths do become Christians. <laughs> they, they embrace like an Aryan form of Christianity. Um, later, Augustine will say is because they were Aryan Christians that they didn't totally slaughter everyone when they could have. But it begins the fall of Rome. And as a result, people are once again blaming Christians for, for this happening. And in response to that, it's like that chorus of voices gets louder like this sort of blame the Christians, blame the Christians, that Augustine writes his famous work, City of God, in which he argues that um, Rome was as corrupt as can be <laughs> in, in all of its history. And he gives this great overview of all of Roman history, going back to Romulus and Remus. It's crazy. I mean, it's breathtaking. And then he argues about what's the nature and character of the city of God. And he says it can never fall. And it's never equated with a state or an empire. So states and empires rise and fall, but the city of God remains forever. And the Christian's goal is to be a citizen of that uh, city, no matter where they live, you know, or in what time they live. So it, it's a powerful book. It, it's, a, you know, it's going to be well over a thousand pages if you were to read an English copy of it. So I recommend an abridged version that, you know, pulls out the highlights. So, uh, but it's good stuff. It'd take you all, all year to read it, probably. <laughs> but good. I just read it last year with a group of students, and that was super fun. You know. um, so these, uh, these folks are all uh, more or less in the West, like the Western Church. There's also people in the Eastern Church who have similar stature as uh, Ambrose and Augustine. People like Basil and his brother Gregory of Nyssa and their sister Macrina. They, along with one of their best friends, Gregory of Nazianzus, are called the Cappadocians. So if you ever see theologians refer to the Cappadocians, they're talking about this group of Eastern theologians whose contributions to Christianity are just as big as Augustine's in the West. So they're doing in the East. Especially their doctrine of the Trinity, uh, their doctrine of uh, the two natures of Christ and the Holy Spirit. In many ways, it's because of their work that you'll get that additional, those additional lines about the Holy Spirit and the Nicene Creed. So if you're familiar with both the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed has the same Trinitarian structure, right? We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son. And then the Apostles' Creed says, we believe in the Holy Spirit, Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, life everlasting, amen. Right? You get that one line. We believe in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> All right. In the Nicene Creed, it says, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified. So he's like more stuff about the divinity and nature of the Holy Spirit. That's coming from the East. Okay, uh, so those are fun figures. Each one are worth studying. Moving from there, I want to talk more about the fall of the Western Empire and a little bit of the important history that happens there. All right. We'll, try to, we'll track the East a little bit later, but in some ways this is more relevant to our own story as people who, uh, as a church that comes out of the Western church. 
So we have more affinities with this story than with what goes on in the East. Makes sense. Uh, the Eastern Church will survive as part of the Byzantine Empire, um, you know, for a long time. But in the West, things get tough. All right, so by 476, the last Roman emperor is deposed. No more. No more Roman emperors in Rome or in the West after 476. So they have basically have been operating as client kings anyway. And the Eastern Empire had been the strong side and the West was the weak side, or believe it or not. So once it falls, I mentioned last week you have, it sort of creates what we call the Dark Ages in many ways because the, that part of Western Europe is in disarray. Right? There's no obvious leaders, and you just have small kingdoms all throughout Europe. Some will start to grow in power over time. Eventually, the Franks rise as the dominant power in that part of the world. And the Franks are in modern day, like France and Spain, parts of Germany. Uh, they will keep growing, and that's going to become important. All right? I'll come back to it in a second. Uh, Christianity will continue to spread throughout those lands. Missions like St. Patrick to Ireland are just one example. He's commissioned by the bishop in Rome to go be the bishop in Ireland and spread the gospel there, which it does. You have Christianity spreading among the Angles and Saxons in what we call Great Britain today. Um, there's another guy named Augustine. Don't get confused. Don't <laughs> uh, he's, he's usually distinguished by being called Augustine or Augustine of Canterbury. As opposed to, this is St. Augustine of Hippo. So Augustine of Canterbury is sent by the Pope to Great Britain to bring uh, the Roman church there. There's, like, there's already Christian communities in Great Britain before the Roman Catholic church gets there. And we usually refer to those as Celtic. It's like Celtic Christians. So there's Celtic Christian communities within the, uh, in the second century flourishing in Great Britain. That is, they're, they're Christian communities that are not under the authority of Rome. Like, they have no relationship to the Bishop of Rome. You understand? It's making sense. And it helps because they're across the English Channel. They're kind of up there by themselves. You know, far away from things. Well, the, the Bishop of Rome wants to bring them into the fold, as, as it were. <laughs> and that's why Augustine is sent there. <clears throat> this is going to become important later. So this is almost the year 600, Right? Uh, if you were to, let's all pause what we're doing in our progression and think, jump forward 900 years, uh, there's going to become a, a time in English history where the king says, let's separate from the Church of Rome again, when Henry VIII, and he recognizes he has some precedent for it, because he can, he can argue the English church existed before Rome was here, and so we've been independent before, we can be independent again. And so that will begin the English Reformation in the 1500s. All right. What were the origins of those Christians? Like, was the Celtic the communities? Yeah. yeah, well, some of it's mysterious, you know, like yeah. <laughs> we have unnamed, un, you know, unknown uh, missionaries that go. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, there, we know some of the stories. You can, there's a book called History of the Church in England which we'll talk some about that if you're interested in studying that more. Mormon is the guy's name who wrote that. Mormon with two O's. And then what's the other one? Um, the Venerable Bede. Have you seen this name before? Also tells the history of Celtic Christians and some of the names involved. I mean, they're all like hard to pronounce stuff, you know, like <laughs> who are the people that brought this? You know? Yes. So Saxons, is that like from Saxony and Germany? It's all complicated. You know, it's, it's all convoluted. Like, you can sometimes look up on YouTube, like, where do the people come from that eventually make up, you know, the English? You know, a lot of them are coming from Scandinavia or uh, from the Norse lands. And so I think Saxons originate there uh, before they're in Germany. And then uh, you have... Yeah, I just read this two days ago. So yeah, okay. You know what's up? There was a Saxony where uh, actually the, um, after Charlemagne, some of the kings came from Saxony, mm -hmm. the German area, and they were what's called Saxony. Mm -hmm. So they're probably the same kind of Saxons came from there. <laughs> but yeah, yeah well, there was a little yeah. area of Saxony. British history is really complicated, more complicated than we 
usually assume, especially when there's kingdoms fighting against each other for centuries, that would all be regarded today as British people, you know, but they're really not. You know, they come from other places. <laughs> the Britons were just one of those groups of, uh, of people. Um, it's sort of like it gets whitewashed if, it's, if they're just called English or British or even just white. It's like, <laughs> like no, these were you know, people groups that pretty much didn't like each other and fought each other for a long time. Okay, let's keep going. Um, another important development during this time is the monasticism becomes established as a dominant form of Christianity in the West. Um, and large, it's largely done by the leadership of St. Benedict. So St. Benedict is usually regarded as the fountainhead of modern monasticism. When you think of a monastic community at a, at a monastery or a convent, they're following some form of Benedict's rule. And Benedict's rule is just something he wrote up that was meant to order their daily lives. When you think about monastics praying, you know, seven times a day throughout the day, those seven times of prayer are established by Benedict. The combination of work and prayer uh, as being part of their common life. So it's not like they just stay in their little cells and pray all the time. They also work the land and sometimes are craftsmen and such. In fact, Monasteries will become like precursors to universities because monks will be the ones who become teachers. They copy manuscripts, so they're usually very literate folks. They would even be druggist, like doing a kind of herbal medicine. Um, one of the most famous monastics in that world is Hildegard of Bingen, who like develops all these medicines. They're agriculturalists. They'll be some of the first missionaries. In many ways, Western Christianity depends on monastics for its survival uh, from a human perspective uh, and its development. It, this is, I think this is one of those areas of church history that uh, Protestants find most foreign since we don't, we don't have many monastic communities among Protestants. There are actually some. There's some Anglican um, monasteries out there, but it doesn't feel like a part of our history, and we... Uh, often don't recognize or appreciate how through what we call the Dark Ages, the Dark Ages is just that first part of the Middle Ages, beginning with the fall of the Roman Empire in the West up until about uh, the Charlemagne's reign. So that 400-year, 350-year period. The monastics are the ones sustaining Christianity through that time. They're the ones... They're, like if you're looking for bright lights, like examples of genuine faithfulness in the dark ages, you would look no further than the monasteries. That's where you find it. And I mean, we should really thank God for their existence because many of the manuscripts we have access to are because of their work. The earliest copies of the Bible that we have were discovered in monasteries, you know, <laughs> like in Syria and Egypt and the Middle East, ones that had been copied, you know, millennia, like over a thousand years ago. So like Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, you know, like these are manuscripts of the whole Bible that go back to the 300s um, that were copied and kept and preserved in that monastery uh, in Mount Sinai. Uh, so that's good stuff. We should thank God for them. We think of them as sort of weird or something. You wouldn't believe uh, how fast monasteries were growing, uh, both for men and for women throughout the Middle Ages. And notice that they have these three basic vows. You know, they make a vow of poverty, so they're like pulling out of the normal economic system. They make vows of chastity, like sexual purity. They're, they're, they will live unmarried, sexually chaste lives, and uh, obedience to their abbot. You know, sort of the abbot is functioning like a bishop within the community. I think in our world, we think it, that would be a crazy sort of vow, you know. <laughs> Why would you deny the things that everyone else seems to be living for, you know? And they saw something more valuable, more important, and that wholehearted devotion to Jesus without distraction, so to speak. It's funny, I was saying this to a class of students at Barry maybe last year, and I was, I was thinking, what do you think is attractive about a monastic life? And I was surprised at how many students were saying, I'm kind of drawn to that actually now. <laughs> it's like they feel just over buzzed by techno life, you know, and being pulled in every direction to have a view about this, that, or the other. And like, I just want to pull things down to simple hearted devotion to Christ. And like, it actually seems pretty wonderful. 
<laughs> like, yeah, I can get that. Uh, almost every significant figure you can think of from the Middle Ages comes out of a monastery. Like the good popes, there are, there are good popes in that time. There's bad ones, but there's good ones too. They almost all come out of monastic communities. Um, the early missionaries like Patrick uh, come out of monasteries. St. Augustine forms a monastery, uh, a monastic community around him in his later years. Uh, all of those people over there are monastics in one way or another from the East. Um, and then the, the person we consider to be the father of the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther, was an Augustinian monk before he <laughs> becomes a reformer. You know, it's, it's really the institution sustaining the church in the West more than any other. Uh, the monastics, another important thing is there are times when the papacy, this is the Bishop of Rome, will go afoul say it that way in one way or another if anybody were to stand up to them or call them out it's always a monastic to do so you know like so they are ones like really serious about guarding the purity of the church uh, and sustaining popes in rome often had to deal with the the issues of like matters of state you know and holding holding communities together and raising armies even to defend uh, rome from foreign invaders when no one else could do so so that left them at least open to the, or vulnerable to corruption and power, greed, and wealth. Uh, that's another thing. The monastics are usually distinct from your average bishop because bishops during this time have access to land and wealth and you know, kind of ease. And the monastics are intentionally becoming like a living rebuke of them. Um, and so when you, in, the, in the history of Western Christianity, there's often this tension between the bishops and the monastics. Um, I don't know, have any of you ever read this book by Umberto Eco uh, called The Name of the Rose? Have you ever heard, read this or heard of it? It's a, if you love theology and philosophy and good literature, it's a, book, it's a good book to read. I recommend it. But one of the things that comes out is... Um, what we think of as the Inquisition, like uh, popes like sending out inquisitors to punish heretics and stuff, they usually started with monastics. Like they weren't going out after pagan unbelievers. They're going like after their own. And one of the reasons they did that is because the poverty of the monastics was always rebuking the wealth and opulence of the popes in Rome. And so they had that, that tension between them. All right, so let me see. We've got St. Benedict's Rule, Papacy. And we're in the last few minutes here. Let's see. So there, these, I've tried to list out some of the good popes and their contributions in your notes there. Find myself. As I said, there are many in that history that you might call questionable, and it's going to get worse after, after 800. We're going to move into a time where one time, there'll be like two or three competing popes, and it'll move from Rome to Avignon, France, and such. But there's some good ones that contribute along the way. We'll start with Leo the great, his, you see the dates of his reign, uh, 440 to 460. And yes, that's how you refer to a bishop's rule as his reign, um, which is interesting. But Leo is a, a real and important theologian. His work will contribute to one of the great ecumenical gatherings at Chalcedon in 451. At this point, the Western church is debating how Jesus' divine and human natures relate to each other. They're trying to make sense of that. And they're, so they're trying to say, what, how should we think of Jesus as sort of a, a hybrid? Is he like a Hercules figure, <coughs> demigod? You know, or is he sort of like have two minds he can sort of access? You know, a divine mind and a human mind. Because you get this affirmation of Jesus' humanity and divinity in the Bible. What you don't get is an explanation of how it works, right? And much of the problem... As theologians are taking stabs at it, you know, is they, this, the assumption that we know what human is and we know what divine is and we're trying to like, boom, boom, like pull, put them together in Jesus in some way rather than letting Jesus be the definer of what humanity is and what divinity is, which is the proper direction to go. But so you have all these missteps. Eventually, at the Council of Chalcedon, they formed something called the Chalcedonian Definition. Any of you heard of this before, Chalcedonian Definition? Where the idea of the hypostatic union is affirmed. The hypostatic union is the idea that it's, it's stating it this way, using this language, that Jesus is one person with two natures. One person with two natures. So... 
This comes from the Greek word for a person, hypostatic, the union of these, these two natures. But rather than trying to describe how the two natures fit together, it does so apophatically. Anybody know what that word means? <laughs> apophatically is like negative theology. It's where you say what something is not rather than saying what it is. And by saying what something is not, you remove options from the table and you leave what is a kind of mystery. That's what they do. They say, so the hypostatic union is a great mystery, how Jesus' divinity and humanity connect. But we can say that they connect without division, separation, confusion, or change. These are known as the four withouts. You know, so the two, one person in two nature, without division or separation, without confusion or change. And each one of those words responds to some option that someone was offering. So like you had this guy named Nestorius. And Nestorius is saying, well, Jesus is one person, but the two natures remain completely separate from each other, completely distinct, such that you can read through the Bible and say, oh, that's Jesus' humanity doing that, and that's his divinity doing that, as if it's two people you know, living in one body. Well, the church rejects that idea. They said, no, it can't, you can't separate that. That's when you end up saying the human Jesus died, but the divine Jesus didn't die. And they actually reject that. They would say God actually does experience a human death in the death of Christ. God continues to exist ontologically, but he experiences a human death in the person. That is the, what one side experiences or does, the other side does too. Are you following me? <laughs> so without separation, division, they're certainly not at odds with each other. That would be division. Without confusion, that was the idea that Jesus is neither really human or divine, that the two things are just mixed up to create some new third thing, you know, and the church rejects that idea too, you know, or change. Change, that's the idea that the humanity or the divinity has to be compromised. One of them has to be compromised in order for there to be a coexistence. They reject that too. But neither is compromised. The divinity is not, is fully there and fully integrous, like its integrity is intact, and the humanity is fully there, you know, intact. So this is really an important council in the history of the church. Um, if it's one you don't know about, I encourage you to read it. And just look up the Chalcedonian Creed or Chalcedonian definition online to see how that affirmation reads. It establishes orthodoxy hereafter, you know. All right, so Leo contributes to that, and really it's his writing that sort of settles the matter. There's this writing called Leo's Tome, and Leo basically is saying everybody's arguing for these options. This is why they can't be, and this is how it works. And it carries the day. It carries the argument. It wins. So he makes a big contribution to theology. Gregory the Great, maybe you've heard of him, if you've ever heard of Gregorian Chant. You know, or the Gregorian calendar. Um, he establishes both of those things. So Gregory is sincere in his desire for worship. He's actually kind of an unusual pick for it, you know, because of his. He probably was not well suited for the administration role, uh, but was well suited as a spiritual example. Let's talk about Leo the Third. Leo the Third becomes important mostly because of his crowning of Charlemagne and establishing the Holy Roman Empire. Charlemagne is king of the Franks. Remember them up here? So that's why he's important. And he's emerged as the most powerful king in the region. If the Pope in Rome wants an ally who can protect Rome, who can protect the church, the Franks had also converted to Christianity way back in the 5th century. So in late 5th century, they had converted to Catholic Christianity or Nicene Christianity. So they were a perfect ally. So this basically brings the church and state back together, such that the Holy Roman Empire is the continuation of Western Christendom. Right? Remember, Christendom is what we said with Constantine. You sort of lose it for a little bit as life is in turmoil. Now it's fully established with the Holy, Holy Roman Empire. Now people have tried to joke because of Saturday Night Live, it's neither holy nor Roman nor an empire, right? But it actually is all of those things. I mean, it's functioning as all of those things. The Roman part is that the bishop of Rome is at the heart of it. 
you know. And it always raised this question, and it's always a problem in the Western Empire. Like, who really has the power? Is it the emperor or the pope? You know, if the pope crowns the emperor king, does that make him more powerful or you know, more authoritative? And you have discourse back and forth throughout uh, those Western ages. So that where, where popes will assert themselves as the spiritual authority, they have ultimate authority even over the political realm. And then you have various emperors saying, sometimes sort of, and sometimes just saying no to that. It functions very differently in the East. There's more harmony between bishops and emperors, but not in the West. It's a tense relationship. Um, why is that important? Well, the Holy Roman Emperor, the Holy Roman Empire will technically last all the way up until the time of Napoleon in the 1800s. He's the last Holy Roman Emperor. It will shape all of European society. At one time or another, all of Europe is part of this, this thing, this Holy Roman Empire. All of Europe and the Western side, uh, Eastern Europe is part of the Eastern Empire. And so the Catholic Church will shape the life and history of Western Europe. You know, for centuries, or pretty much anyone who lived during those times in any of those countries would have been baptized as a Christian as a child, confirmed at a certain age, married in the church, buried in the church, you know, um, took part in masses and confession and stuff like that, up until the Protestant Reformation, which kind of blows it to pieces in good ways, mostly. <laughs> When did it start to get corrupt when they started asking for money? For, I mean, maybe it's always corruption. But yeah, you should th yeah, you should think of it as kind of going up and down. You know? So basically, people say the rise of Constantine in the 4th century is going to bring the door, open the door for corruption among bishops. But you have some that are pure-hearted and some less so. You know? um, that's what I was trying to highlight. There's some good ones along the way. It seems that the more entangled they were with political affairs, the less... They were examples of Christian leadership and shepherding and such. Uh, but there's, in many ways, if the Pope is like this, the Pope is more than a person. It's an institution that holds together that Western society, right? So you don't have people who want to throw off the Pope or throw off the church, even if they want to reform it. And one of the things I hope you'll see when we get to the Reformation is the Reformation is the culmination of centuries of smaller reforming efforts within the church, where you do have people trying to make positive changes. And then Luther really becomes kind of the last straw that, that breaks it open. He's by no means the first like, person to think of these things. You know. I really feel like as we sit in 2024 and we feel the yeah. pain or confusion or weariness of our current state, yeah. you know, like as we study history, it, yeah. it's actually quite... Comforting and encouraging. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. Know? That's right. We tend to think, well, this is the worst it's ever been. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It, That's exactly true. It, it's quite encouraging and comforting just to know throughout history that we're not alone. Yep. We've all been since just the beginning trying to seek yep. and find the way, the best way. Mm -hmm. And um, in your opening prayer, when you said, learning our story so we can faithfully embody it. And feel like everybody in the room kind of lit up when you said the monasticism mm -hmm. just really held on to it. Mm -hmm. There's just, I'm leaving with a different appreciation oh, and encouragement. Yeah. And comfort. Just knowing. Yes, that's good. We've always been trying to figure it out. We're <laughs> yeah. all still trying to figure it yeah. out. And, and people imagine, I mean, there, it's easy to find tons of parallels between ancient Rome and like the modern United States, for instance. And its political system or its tensions with church and state. It's like those were there there then too. And the fall of Rome was devastating. When it does fall in 410, it's, really, it's literally earth shattering because it had been a 1,000 year republic slash empire. And so when, when people see that, oh, if, if Rome, the eternal city it was called, can fall, then life as we know it is just over. You know? And Augustine's there as the great prophet saying, oh no, no, no. The kingdom of God will endure, you know. It'll take a new form. Things are going to change, but it will endure. It's not tied to the fate of Rome, just like the church is not tied to the fate of our country or any other country, you know, in history. But in our own times, we emphasize what we think is really important. 
the study of history, one of its great benefits is that perspective, I think. I may have said the first week that all of history contains its like ridiculous moments and its wonderful moments, <laughs> its foolishness and its wisdom, its beauties and its horrors. Every age of history has that, including our own, right? And so to ignore the study of history is, one, not to learn from those beautiful, wise, and you know, good moments and treasure them and sustain them and retain them, but also not to learn from the mistakes of, of the past, which there are, as we, as we know, any human institution makes mistakes. Um, and somehow it endures. Okay, uh, that's, that's all the time we got. We'll see if there's a final question or comment. Uh, yeah. The, with the West and Latin splitting, is that kind of near the beginning of the like, Greek Orthodox Church? Or where does that kind of schism by yes. come into play? So it's already functioning uh, in terms of the culture after the 476 because the church in the East is taking on a life of its own. But they're still formally united with the church in the West. It's only in 1054, which we'll get to next time. 1054 is the year of the Great Schism between the East and the West, where it now is formally referred to as the Greek or Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. They would still think of themselves during this time as one church and would use the words Catholic to refer to both or Orthodox to refer to, refer to both. Only later does those names become associated with different streams of the church. Makes sense. I would say the, the thing we need to start with next time is we'll t- start talking about the rise of Islam and its impact, especially on the Eastern Church, because it's going to decimate you know, large chunks of the Greek Eastern Empire. And that starts in the 600s. So we'll start there and hopefully get through the Great Schism. Thank you. Go in peace.